I'm here. Okay, there we go. Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, Jeremy? Is it sound good? Perfect. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Okay. Th thanks for the opportunity. Um, Jeremy um, and I know each other from various things. And um, one of the things that I'm starting to do, which I wanted to get a bit of feedback from you guys, is um, we are, with Jeremy as well, we're starting a new app, which will hopefully go live in around October. And the main part of the app will be that we will set up these uh, communities where you guys will be able to connect with other people um, around South Africa who might be going through some of the things as you are to discuss it and to develop you know, peer support groups. And then also from time to time, hopefully quite regularly to have input from experts like psychologists, counselors, um, social workers, psychiatrists, medical doctors, um, other experts who can um, help you know, run groups that you, in, in areas and topics that you guys are interested in where you can join those groups and get some advice and share some of your experiences as well. So I wanted to get a little bit of feedback about that. And um, this is a very, it's a big forum. I think there's about 25 people already. Um, so I thought that um, what we, that, that I'll open it up to you. Um, and um, I think Jeremy has spoken to me about the three biggest issues which you guys are, are stressed about, which are exams um, and financial concerns and issues that have been raised through COVID. Um, I, I can't speak on any of those, you know, with any kind of uh, specifics, but I'd like to hear a little bit about your stories. And maybe what I can try and do, just having been in the industry for a while, is to point you in the right direction where you might be able to find the help that you need now, depending on, on how stressed you guys are. So let me open it up to you. And um, I think the thing to do is to um, raise your hand or start something on the chat if you can. Um, or Jeremy will moderate the session and um, he will say, you know, who should be given a chance to talk. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks so much, um, Alan. Guys, if just raise, I think it's easier than actually putting it on the chat on the side. Let's just raise your hand. I can go through it because we've actually got a, we've got enough people here. Um, so put your hand up and if you've got the main theme for tonight is obviously on those topics, but if you've got a story that you'd like to share or a question that you'd like to ask Alan, um, please, let's, let's go through it. Don't be, don't be shy. You know, we're all in this, uh, in this together and, you know, we're trying to solve a lot. Uh, it's a bigger issue, this, um, for everyone. And I think the most important thing here that Alan's going to get across is where we actually go for help and where do we go to try and sort out um, the issues that we have and as students, as counselors, and where do we go to? So just, I think if you go to the reactions on the bottom of your screen, you can just click on that and then you'll be able to get inside there. So you, any, anyone go first, guys, don't be scared. Let, let me ask a question, um, uh, Jeremy. Um, do, in the app that we're developing, you'll be able to share anonymously. Now, obviously, you know, you guys, all your names are on here. Some of, I can only see your first names, most of you. But would it be a help if this was more anonymized? Um, I mean, I, we can't anonymize it for this evening, but um, may, maybe just try and pretend that you're anonymous. Um, tell me that you've got a friend who's going through an issue. That's always a good way to start. Guys, you got to share something, eh? Otherwise, I'm going to call you. Claudia, have you got something to share? Let's go to Claudia. Ask her, I need to go. Let's go to ask her. I need to go. I sent something through to The other thing is, do you all know how to use, uh, um, do you all know how to use Zoom? Let's go to the chat. Uh, okay, so there, on, on the chat here, what measures are we taking to identify students that need help? Because not everyone will want to. Okay.
So, Alan, I think maybe just generally speaking, reaching, well, building from that, that question, if there is anyone who needs urgent help, maybe it's worth outlining, for example, SADAG as a resource, um, as a starting point. Okay, did you, I mean, are you reading on that chat there, Al? What measures are we taking to identify? Sorry, Alan. Yes. Okay. So, so, Alan, can you see, can you see that question on the chat there? I can. I can. Um, so if anybody is feeling desperate, there are a number of um, options for you. Um, the, the, the most uh, common one that people are using at the moment are the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, uh, SADAG. I don't have the numbers with me. I'm sorry. We can try and post them. But, um, you know, before COVID, they were getting about, uh, I think, about 20 to 25,000 calls a month, which still sounds like a lot. You know, South Africans are a very stressed out, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are a very stressed country, really. Um, but now, during COVID, the last few months, they've been getting over 50,000 calls a month and 10,000 calls, around 10,000 calls a month to the suicide line. So I think that, you know, if you guys are very stressed out and hopefully none of you are suicidal, but you aren't alone. Um, and, um, you know, we're just living through incredibly stressful times. And I think to be a student and to try and manage social distancing and have some kind of student life and, um, you know, financial issues and everything on top of it. I, I think that it's, it's, it's what, what, should have, what should have been and could have been actually a stressful, but really kind of fun time in your lives is turning out to be much more stressful. So SEDEG is one place where you can phone if you're desperate. And other places you can phone are, um, there are helplines. There are helplines that will help you regardless of whether you are um, insured or not. There's the NetCare helpline and the ACASA helpline. Um, and then there's also um, the public hospitals, which, you know, are not fantastically run, but the psych psychology part of the public hospitals are pretty well run. So if anybody wants more resources, you know, please just do let me know. Oh, uh, just to stand a little bit further back from your speaker, I think the a bit of yeah, try that. Okay, so we've got a um, we've got a question here. Um, can you take us through the mental health awareness symptoms? So what are the take us through some mental health. So what are the symptoms for mental health? And, and, and then obviously you've already gotten up on what to do, but what are some of the symptoms? So that's what the students are asking. How do we know if we have a mental health issue or if we have something that's, that's not 100% right? Okay. Um, so the, the most common mental health problems are depression and anxiety. Can you all hear me? Sorry, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thanks, Al. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, the most common mental health problems are depression and anxiety. So let's talk about depression. Depression, what you, what you look for in a depression is really a change in a person's behavior over a period of time. Um, and that those changes have been present for about two weeks. And what you're looking for is a change in a person's appetite, whether they've got an appetite or whether they're overeating because they're emotionally eating, um, a change in their sleeping patterns. Generally, people are sleeping more, but sometimes they sleep, but they can't stay asleep, would be a symptom of depression. Um, if they stop doing things that they used to find pleasurable, listening to music, hanging out with friends, um, things that they just used to really enjoy, and they just you just find they're not doing those things anymore. If they have a problem in, in the concentration, where they just can't focus for periods of time, again, it's a change. They've always had problems in concentration, that's something different, but if you were able to concentrate before, and now you can't, that might be a symptom of depression. And the last one is a change in your sexual habits, um, whether your libido is really low and you just don't feel like having intimacy or whether you're kind of using sex as a way to distract yourself from, from a depression and, and your, your sexual behavior has changed. So if you look at those things and there's been a change and that change has been consistent for the last couple of weeks, you might be facing um, you know, something that, that we would call depression. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's depression, and maybe people might want to comment on that. When you talk about anxiety, which often goes hand in hand with depression, you're talking about thoughts that you can't really block. So, and you end up sometimes avoiding certain situations because they make you anxious, avoiding certain people, avoiding certain places, 
um, that might make you anxious or doing certain things that make you anxious. Um, and, and again, you're looking at a change. If it's a problem, then you're looking at a change in a person's behavior over a period of time. And then you can know that a person is, is maybe suffering from anxiety. And then, you know, there, there's, there's lots of options for treatment, but let me stop there and let's see if anybody else wants to, wants to comment on that. So, so Alan, um, thanks, that's, that's great. We've had, we've had one comment from, from a student that said that they've uh, wanted to be by themselves um, all the time now uh, um, and, and when I feel sad and she feels sad. You know, she wants to know is that normal? Lately, I've been wanting to just be by myself all the time, and I feel sad. Is is that normal? Um, you know, given specifically the the times that we're in, um, specifically we've been told to social distance, to keep away from each other. You know, we've got students, and the the, the most fun, and I'm sure you can corroborate on that, is is about being social. I mean, we social animals. Um, what can you tell us about that? And how to deal with it? How, 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 what do you suggest for our students who are basically stuck um, without being yeah. able to socialize? Well, I think uh, so let, let me answer the question directly first. Again, what we're looking for here is we're looking for a change in behavior. So if, if um, the student that asked the question, if, um, if you have always liked to withdraw, when you're feeling a bit sad, well, that just might be your way of coping and that you might withdraw for a day or two days or a few days, and then you can sort of gather your energy and um, you know, start socializing again. And just a quick kind of rule of thumb, you know, we have people who are introverts and we have people who are extroverts. Um, and introverts get energy by being on their own, but extroverts get energy from being with other people. So if you happen to be you know, kind of introverted and when you're feeling a bit sad and overwhelmed, your natural response is to just go and, and be by yourself for a little while. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if it's a change and what's happening is that you're isolating yourself from other people because you're feeling sad, then I think that that's something that you should try and address in some way. Um, and the way to address that um, is, you know, th there's, there are, you know, there, there are clinics where you can chat to the nurses and some of the medications, and I'm, I'm not saying the medication should be the first thing that you do, but some of the medications are very effective and very cheap. Um, so you might all have heard of Prozac. Some of the generic medications, which work just the same way as Prozac, are really good, have been proven over a long period of time and are really cheap. And they can help you to kind of just raise your serotonin levels to the point where you can engage in a way that sort of helps you along the way. That's one option for you. Um, I'm sorry, Jeremy, I've been speaking a lot again and I, I forgot the second part of your question. Just, just, in, terms, sorry, just in terms of where, being social, you know, students are social, social beings. We, as humans, we're social beings. And because we've been cut off with COVID, what are, the, what are the suggestions or are there any suggestions on how to, for students to deal with this? Do you, you know, this isolation is obviously a huge issue. And, you know, people spending more and more time just by themselves and in their heads. Are there, are there ways to deal with it? Um, there are, and I'm going to get into that in a second. The first thing I should ask, I've kept my camera on on purpose just so that people could see me when I talk. Is it easier in terms of bandwidth if I turn my camera off? Um, I'm fine. Eh? I think, no, it looks like everybody's okay. You're coming to be perfect. Okay. Okay, good. Look, I think that social isolation uh, because of COVID has, has, has been probably, uh, the, the, the fear of dying has been pretty big, but for social, for students who are much younger and who most of you, you know, have not had that real fear of dying because it's, it's people who are dying from COVID are, are generally much older or kind of sick. Um, I think the biggest impact has been the social isolation and the, the loneliness that's come with it. And, um, I think that we, you know, during, during some of the research for our app, I think we, we saw that I think 65% of people in the UK at the moment say that their TV sets are their major source of, um, of interaction. I don't know if they're talking to their TV or they just feel like the TV kind of provides some kind of distraction, but a lot of people are feeling incredibly isolated and lonely. And, um, you know, I think that... Um, we're hoping to address some of that through the app, but obviously there's no, um, 
it's, it's not a comp you can't you can't compare talking to an app to sort of really being able to be closer to people and it's hopefully that's something that will end quite soon when we get the vaccination rolling out i don't have any easy answers for you i have seen that there are a few things coming through on the on the chat jeremy should i try there's a yeah there's quite a lot i i, I think the next the next question on the chat is about anxiety and being overwhelmed oh. so yeah the student wants to know you know when they get anxious about one thing it tends to trigger a whole lot of uh, effects on solving you know on solving issues and um, they might feel overwhelmed um, as the as the issue just keeps on amplifying you know yeah. what what do, what do we do about things like that um <laughs> You know, again, there are different ways of, of addressing, um, you know, these kind of constant thoughts that make you anxious that really interfere with everything that you do, um, including just having normal thoughts and normal conversation um, and, and your normal relationships. And Jeremy, I, I mean, I hope I'm not giving you anything away, but something I know that you do that I do as well is practice mindfulness. And I think the thing about practicing mindfulness, and there are lots of ways that you can go on the internet, um, you can download free apps about mindfulness, is that if you practice mindfulness, and really what I mean by that is sitting quietly um, with your eyes closed and just watching your thoughts, what, what you start to realize is that your brain um, is like a bit of a kind of, um, it's just, it's just, it can be very overactive at times. And then what you realize is the thoughts come and they go, and they come and they go if you're sitting quietly and you're just watching them. But when you're not mindful, those thoughts can kind of attach themselves to something. And, and that can just kind of complicate everything else. So to that person, what I would recommend is try and practice some kind of mindfulness um, and, and think about and, and watch how your mind gets that, get, get, gets that thought and then the thought disappears again as you think about that you're hungry, what are you gonna have for dinner? I wonder why that person hasn't phoned me. And you can just watch your mind and then either go back to your breathing or find a mantra. But I think that mindfulness can really help with that. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Um, I think that's a, that it really is a great help. I find it over the years, it really has helped me. Uh, the next question, I just want to try to get through a lot. Of, there's so many questions coming through now. Um, the student has asked, is, is sleeping a good coping me mechanism? Is it healthy, especially when overwhelmed? So it's obviously a big theme about being overwhelmed at the moment. Yeah. Um... I think sleeping is, is wonderful, and um, I think that generally as, as humans, and certainly I remember when I was a student, I definitely did not get enough sleep. So I think that sleep can be, can be great and it can be very healing. But if there's been a big change, and, and what you find is that you're always sleepy, and that we used to be able to get six or seven hours sleep a night and, and, and really function well, and now suddenly you know, you're sleeping much longer hours, then that might be something that, that might be a symptom of something larger. Um, so I think sleep is good, but if there's a change and you're sleeping much more and you're actually struggling to stay awake when you should be awake, then I think that's something that you should go and talk to somebody about. Right, thanks, Al. Um, the, next, the next student uh, has asked, how does one know, it, it's got to do with childhood trauma. I feel like I can't really depend on anyone, not even my parents, and it makes me not trust anyone else. Or if I find it hard to ask for help. Um, I'm finding it hard to communicate with other people and to make friends. So it doesn't feel like she belongs. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a very relevant question in, in our current time. It is. Um, I think that our country is a, um, it, it, there's, there's so much stress and so much trauma in our country, um, you know, when you when when you talk about childhood uh, trauma, um, there really isn't an easy answer. I think that psychotherapy is um, is a great resource because what happens with childhood trauma is that you start to develop certain ways of being in the world, and um, you you kind of in a way create your own reality where. It, it, it seems unbelievable, but you find yourself in similar situations over and over again. And I think that un, until you work through your childhood trauma, um, you, you might carry on finding yourself in the same situations. As an example, 
Um, you know, if, if you grew up in a home where somebody was an alcoholic and they were abusive, you might grow up thinking, I will never, ever find myself in a relationship with someone who's an alcoholic or abusive. And lo and behold, you meet someone and you think they're so amazing and they turn out to be an alcoholic and abusive. Um, and I think there's something within us um, that develops this way of being in the world that becomes familiar. And even though we try and avoid it, it's so strong that we actually, in the end, find ourselves in these similar situations. And I think that, honest, if, if, if we don't manage that, I think there's even a danger of passing it on to our children. So I don't mean to make you feel guilty in any way, but I think it's really important if, you had, if you've had significant childhood trauma to start talking about it, to find someone that you trust, and then to find a clinic. Um, uh, where, where, where are most of the students, Jeremy? Which area of Joburg? In, in, in Bramfontein, in Johannesburg. Okay, so, so BITS have got a really good um, outpatient unit. Um, I, I don't know the details, but um, I'm sure you could find those online. Uh, there's a BITS trauma unit, I think. Um, and um, the other place would be um, the Helen Joseph Hospital has got a psychiatric unit. Now, that doesn't, doesn't mean you need to be hospitalized, but they would have outpatient units as well. Um, Tara, if you live anywhere around Alex, you'd be zoned for Tara. Um, and they've also got great outpatient clinics. Um, I think the Charlotte has got an out, yeah, the Charlotte does have an outpatient clinic as well. So it's about going to your local hospital or local clinic if you don't have any kind of insurance or going to VITS. Thanks, Al. Um, the next question has got to do with panic attacks and how we deal with panic attacks. So I think maybe just first define what a panic attack is so everyone understands it and then uh, and then I think um, if you can give us some advice on it. So I mean I would so love the person to um, who, who asked the question to actually tell us a little bit about their own experience of it. I mean I can tell you the theory around panic attacks but I wonder if that person would like to um, would like to they can decline maybe I'll give them 10 seconds. I'll ask them, I'll ask them. No, hold on a sec. Okay. Let's just see. Yeah, okay, I'm just gonna let them, I'm gonna open it up to them. So just hold on one sec. Huh? Great, thank you. Oh, better find them now. Tabu, can you hear us? I can hear. Can you, um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly, Tabu. Thanks for thanks so much for sharing. Okay, so I'm, I'm the one who like I mentioned the issue of uh, being overwhelmed with issues and all that. So when that happens, I often at times I get in a state of panic where at times uh, sometimes I lose I, I I I run out of breath and all that, and uh, sometimes I get it gets difficult for me to breathe and then I lose almost um, most of the function of my body. I just lie down in my room most of the times and all that. So what I do is that I'm, I was advised by my doctor saying that I should try by all means to try and breathe and not focus on any other thing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I wanted to know if maybe when that doesn't help, is there any other method that I can maybe try in um, incorporating for me to be able to deal with this issue. Yeah. Um, the, there's, the, there's a very kind of um, uh, popular way of, of managing the, the breathing around panic attacks, which is for you to carry with you a brown paper bag. And when you feel like you can't breathe, to breathe into that paper bag. And there's something about the carbon dioxide that you're breathing into that bag that will help you to slow down your breathing. And I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I've seen it work. So try that, just get a, a normal brown paper bag, carry it with you. And the next time you, you, you're struggling with your breathing, try, try that technique and see if it helps. But the underlying issue is why you're having the panic attacks and how to manage them in a way. So, so what happens with panic attacks is because they can be so debilitating and you described it so well that you can just lie down and you don't feel like you can do anything else. 
um, you, you start to avoid certain places because you, you're so terrified of having a panic attack. And I, I don't know if that's your experience, but um, the, the, you, there, there's some really good medications. They're the same medications you would use for depression. So the same ones that I spoke about earlier, there's, there's Nuzac, um, and I, I beg your pardon, I can't remember any of the others, um, that are pretty available, and I would speak to your GP about that. And it doesn't mean you need to be on this medication forever, um, but it, um, a course of sort of six, six weeks to six months might really help you to change the behaviors around the panic attacks as well. So try the brown paper bag and speak to your GP, and really, if you could get some counseling, to try and understand why you're having these, these panic attacks, um, that would be so useful for you as well. I wish I could tell you where to go, but I just don't have the answers for that. Thanks, thanks Al. Um, Al, there's, maybe you can help us with this, but the student was talking about uh, oversleeping. It uh, could be a symptom of something and recommends that um, is there anyone that you can recommend that you should speak to? Uh, you know, if if this is a symptom, you know, who who do we go and speak to? You know, I know you have met, mentioned SADAG. Uh, are there other places? Do you speak to your GP? Do you you know? I think the the theme that's coming through is that people just don't know who to go to. Yeah. So. You know, sleeping can, there can be lots of reasons why you might be sleeping and one of them might be depression, but something else might be, you know, something else that's going on that, that could be physical. So what, what my suggestion would be is to go to visit a clinic. Um, I don't know if you can talk about the Curo clinics and where they are, because I think they would be a really good place to start. I'm not the Curo, the, um, what, what are, is, is it Curo? No, it's not Curo. What's it, Jeremy? Uh, uh, quite care clinics. Yeah, exactly. To, to go and visit those clinics because I think you get very uh, reasonably priced advice and medication there if you needed it. But I think that when you, if you're oversleeping and there's been a change, I think that you should go and chat to somebody who's medically trained um, and your GP or a, a you know, well-trained nurse or a clinical associate would be, the, would be a very good place to start. One thing I've realized is nothing that I can explain that my son is. Sorry, right, uh, we just, uh, Tabo, sorry, I just need to mute. Can you just mute it quickly? Thanks. Um, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Cool. Okay, so guys, uh, I think those are the, the questions that we've had. Anyone else want to ask uh, some more questions? You just type it, just type below so I can scroll through and, uh, um, and have a look at it. I think I'm not coming now. Just waiting for some more questions though. Okay. Oh, uh, um, I, until we get some more questions, um, I think, shall we go through a couple of, uh, you know, more topics for the, uh, for the students? I think in the, the, the main one was, was the exam time and being overwhelmed in the exam time. So we always have issues around coming into exam time, students feel completely overwhelmed, they feel depressed. What are the resources available to them currently, um, if any? Um, Jeremy, uh, you know, I. Uh, uh, Having spent um, my student uh, life um, at Wits and at um, UJ, I'm not sure which of the students, where, which universities they attend, um, and whether those places of learning offer any kind of support. Because uh, I think that'll be the most obvious place to start. Um, and if, um, if, if those places don't offer support or the students are learning online, again, then I would think that they, they should go and visit their local clinic. Um, or their GP if they have one. Okay, thanks. I'll, and and I'll, could you could we maybe just talk a bit about SADAG and how it works? I mean, do you have any insight into that? And and how do the students get in contact with them? I mean, I know they've got a website and just how exactly it works. Yeah, so they um, they have trained counselors who are on standby twenty four seven. 
um, and you can call them at any time and they're going to ask you a couple of questions just to, so that they can add you to their database. And um, they have these trained counselors who will help you, who, who will listen to what, what's going on for you and will help you to find the right resources. So, you know, if you're feeling really desperate, then they will be there as long as you need to talk to them, they'll be there on the line. Um, and they might even help you to find an ambulance if you need to be hospitalized, if, you, if you're really at a point where you are thinking of hurting yourself. Um, otherwise, they will help you to find the right resources in your area. So they, they might re refer you to a clinic or to a psychologist or to you know, a place where you can go to get some, some, some of the help that you need. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got some more questions here. Um, student wants to know, what if you just decide that you no longer want to engage in sexual intercourse? I'm sure it's not always the case that your libido is low and, and you're depressed. Is that correct? Is it, a, is it something of depression? No, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a symptom of depression when it's with all the other symptoms that I spoke about. And um, if you don't understand it, you know, if suddenly you just lose your interest in sex and you used to have, let's say, you know, a so-called healthy interest in sex, um, and then suddenly you're just not interested in it, then you might be, you, you know, you yourself might be concerned that, you know, why is this happening to me? But I think lots of people make conscious decisions, you know, to not engage in sexual intercourse until they're in a meaningful relationship, or even if they're in a meaningful relationship, you know, for lots of different reasons. So I think it's, 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 it's an issue if it's an issue for you. But I think that just deciding, you know, not to have um, sexual intercourse is not a problem in and of itself, so long as you understand why you're doing it. And it's not something that's happening to you. Thanks, Al. Um, I think that the, the next uh, question the students were all asking about is, is in terms of COVID. Obviously, COVID's had a massive impact on everyone and globally. Um, and people can feel it wherever they are. Um, have you got any advice for the students just in dealing with you know, the issues that COVID has brought around in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety, and, um, you know, this is a definite trigger point for people that wasn't there 18 months ago. Yeah, you know, um, I, um, I, I have my own thoughts about this, but I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound overly controversial, but I do think that people need to find a balance between, you know, staying safe from the virus and leading some kind of normal life. Um, you know, I, I see my mother-in-law who is uh, 81 or 82 years old, and she's been so terrified of this, of, of, get, of getting ill, which I totally understand. But I think that since March of last year, I think she's been out maybe five times. And I really see it sort of playing such a, a terrible role in her life in terms of feeling so isolated. The world has suddenly become more scary to her. Um, so I think one needs to find a balance as much as you can and just stay as safe as possible. But I don't know if that's the right advice. And I think it might be quite controversial because I think that all the, all the messages we're getting is, you know, you know, just don't get this, don't get this virus and don't spread it. But I, I do think that there needs to be some kind of pragmatism where you're able to see some friends and just, you know, try and be as safe as possible. But I don't know if that's good advice or not. I'm just sharing what my own personal feeling is. Thanks, thanks, Al. Um, the, the next question is from a student is, is there any way one can control their anxiousness or feeling of overwhelmed or scared, such as um, when you're in an exam room, your mind just becomes foggy or you're unable to make sense of things? Uh, how do you reduce these feelings? That's the question. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of techniques that you can use. I think we spoke about mindfulness, and I think that that's a, 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 really, a, a really good practice if people can do that. And you don't have to do it 20 minutes twice a day. You can do it for five minutes. Um, and it's just about really centering yourself. Really what mindfulness is about is about centering yourself, is about, you know, doing something that puts you back in touch with your body. Um, um, is about, um, you know, whether you feel something, um, whether you listen for something that's outside and you just start centering yourself through using your, your, um, 
your senses. Just say, this is where I am. I'm present, I'm safe, I'm okay. And I'm gonna now focus on my exam. I think so, so mindfulness can be a really you know, useful technique. Another thing is kind of, you know, preparing for the exam, not by learning only, but by imagining yourself arriving at the facility, uh, parking or getting off the bus or whether you walk in there, whatever it is, and then actually going into the exam room and, and picturing yourself sitting down and in your mind, kind of preparing yourself for those moments that when you do sit in those moments, it's got a bit more of a familiarity to it as opposed to it feeling so foreign and so scary. I think those are the two things that I can sort of suggest off the top of my head. I'm sure there are much more useful things that you can find on the internet, but, um, but mindfulness and, and sort of playing it through in your mind before are two things that help me a lot. That's great, thanks, thanks Al. Um, another question that we're getting here is, is it advisable for one to depend, to depend on antidepressants uh, for the rest of their lives? Um, so, so let's talk about antidepressants and what they really are. So there's, there's two different kinds of antidepressants. Uh, well, there's a few different, but let's talk about the most common ones. Um, the most common ones are, are either selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors um, or selective um, nora, noradrenaline um, and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what, what they really mean is that there are these um, chemicals in your brain called serotonin and uh, noradrenaline. And what they do is they help the pleasure pathways to function. Okay, so you've got to imagine your brain, maybe some of you are, are, are medical students or you understand the science of it, but in your brain, you've got these neurons and you've got the synapses between the neurons and you, you need these chemicals to help to, to move the feeling or the emotion from one neuron to the other neuron through the synapse. And what happens when you're depressed is you use up too much serotonin, okay? So your serotonin gets depleted much sooner than it used to get, de get depleted. So a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor inhibits the, your brain from the amount of serotonin it uses. So you keep more serotonin in your brain and the pleasure pathways can work as they should. They, they take about six weeks to kick in and you really feel the most effects of them after about six months. So what, what generally happens, some people need antidepressants for their whole lives because depression runs in families and it's just biology. Your, your, your particular brain and the way that it, it, it developed just uses up too much serotonin. And in order for you to feel normal, like other people feel normal, you just need to be on those antidepressants. But for other people, you might've been through a trauma or a very difficult loss or a breakup or something like that. And it puts you into, a feeling of depression and you feel like you can't shake it and so you go into an antidepressant and that antidepressant can help you through a period of time until you feel healed from that process and then you can go off it so going onto it doesn't mean that you're going to be onto it forever unless there's a genetic predisposition to depression i hope that's useful thanks oh yeah that is very useful and um, the next the next question is this person says they su they supporting a depressed person emotionally, and um, is it possible that you end up affected by their emotional state that you start feeling down and sad as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always think of sort of the um, the the airplane things that you see in movies and and when you're flying that they always say, you know, in the event of a loss of pressure, please put the mask over your face first before you help anyone else. And I always think that's kind of a useful analogy for these situations because, you know, if you're being pulled down as well, you can't really help anyone else. So I, I would suggest, you know, to be a good friend that you, you know, you should be there and you should be able to listen and, you know, offer advice and support and comfort. But if you feel like that, whatever you do, that person still is in the same state. Um, and they are, you know, just not getting better and they're really draining you of your energy. Then as hard as it is, I think that what you should do is set some boundaries um, and, um, and to say to the person, look, you know, I mean, I love you and you're my friend or whatever it is, but I, 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 can't, I, I can't be there for you in the way that you need me. 
Um, and I suggest that you know that you get some help, and I will help you to help to find that help. But you know you can't look after someone if they if they're making you drown as well. I think uh, that's very that's very sage advice, Alan. Yeah. Um, the, so we don't it, guys. Anybody else want to ask a, a question? Um, you, you can either ask it on the chat or you, you can just raise your hand. Uh, I can see if you've raised your hand here. Just let us know. Um, because they'll be coming through thick and faster. If not, I think we can just touch on one more topic before we wrap it up. I think Ellen's probably voice is probably going to uh, tire out in any time soon. We're talking for 45 minutes. L, the the I think that the last thing is, you know, we've spoken about, I mean, it was quite an important thing that came up in terms of money. And it's not, you know, where where can we find money from? It's more around that a lot of students are feeling overwhelmed, that money has become an issue in their lives and they don't have they don't have money. Um, what is the suggestion around that and how do we cope with it besides besides money? Besides making money, but even even then, I don't think it, it, it sorts out the problem that we have. Sure, Jamie, I mean, um, I I don't know if I know if, if I can help with with that. Um, I'm not sure what kind of student loans. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I know about the NASFIS uh, process. I don't know how well that works. Um, I think I think money is, is 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 such a hard thing to to solve through you know through a th therapeutic process um, because it's it's just so practical. I'm sorry, I I don't really have much advice about that. No, that's fine. It's a it's a, it's a tough question. I think it has been coming up. This the sleeping questions coming up. Uh, <laughs> sleeping questions coming up a lot a lot. I like that's a good uh, it's a good answer. Bless. I like that. Um, <laughs> The students saying that they their sleeping pa pattern isn't so. This question has just disappeared. This the sleeping pattern is is uh, not working at all. They are waking up and falling asleep at different times. Is it a sign of depression? Um, I can only sleep during the day and I feel tired even when I'm up. Is, could that be a sign of of depression? I want to know. Um, you know, one of the things that I only learned about when I was working in psychiatric hospitals is this concept of sleep hygiene, which I always thought, you know, meant having a shower before you go to sleep. But actually, it's not that at all. It's um, it's about how well you set up um, your, um, your, 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 your sleep, how, how well you prepare for sleep. You know, whether you are able to, as much as possible, block out noise, whether even if you get those sponge earplugs to put in your ears, um, you know, light, how much can you control light? Um, you know, my daughter sleeps with three things over her eyes because she just can't bear any light coming into, into, her, um, into her room when she's sleeping. Um, so it's, it's about preparing for sleep. I think that if you're in the habit of napping in the afternoon, that's going to interfere with your sleep. Um, so, you know, take it from someone who loves to nap in the afternoons. I, I, I allow myself to do that on the weekends or when I don't have any stress. Um, but otherwise, I just push through because otherwise I struggle to fall asleep. And the, the longer it takes me to fall asleep, the more anxious I get. And the more anxious I get, the harder it is to fall asleep. So I think that if you look up around, like if you start to think about your sleep hygiene and about making the situation as, as comfortable as possible for you to fall asleep and try and keep it as regular as possible. So to fall asleep at 10 or 11 um, every night. I think that's going to improve, even if you have to be very strict with yourself in the beginning until you're self-regulating again, and then you can start to have later nights or earlier nights or whatever it is. But I think sleep hygiene is, is just so important. I think sleep becomes a problem when there's been a change. And I think I, I, I keep saying that, but you know, if you, if you used to comfortably focus a uh, function on six or seven hours or five or hours or eight hours sleep a night, and suddenly you need much more sleep or you're able to fall asleep but not stay asleep and you're waking up at half past two or three in the morning those might be symptoms of a depression um and that's when you should go and visit your clinic thanks um 
and then a student wants to know how how true is it um, that basically they they want to know do you need to love yourself or find yourself be happy with yourself before you can engage with in a relationship with someone else? Um, look, I'm in a relationship with someone else, and I don't always love myself. Um, sometimes I drive myself nuts. But I, I think it helps to kind of know yourself um, and to, to try and understand sort of um, who you are and, and what you bring to a relationship. Um, I, I think that helps before you choose, you know, a life partner. Um, I, I think that one's relationship with oneself is the same as one's relationship with, some, with other people. You know, sometimes you think you're terrific and sometimes you think you're crap. Uh, well, I do anyway. Um, so I think that to... But I, I think that to kind of to work on yourself and to make time for yourself and to sort of know who you are is, is going to make your relationship easier. Because if you don't know who you are, you know, I think that you might end up being very erratic. And what I mean by that with knowing who you are, you don't have to know yourself so intimately, but you just have to accept who you are, you know. Um, yeah. Not so easy, but important to start the process. If definitely not so easy. Um, I, I think I think we're going to wrap it up here, um, and just just want to discuss you know the, the way forward and how we're going to carry on with these things. I think we've we've had a lot of a lot of topics have been discussed here, um, and I think to take it forward would be more along breakaway groups where students get to choose what genre they'd like to to hear about, um, and then Ellen, I think that speaks a lot to the applications that you're developing. Um, also probably yeah. a lot easier than using a Zoom um, down the line. So I, I think that the students probably want to know when are we going to do this again? And guys, I, I, I don't have a definitive time, but as soon as we know, I mean, I think this will, it'll be a, a month. It'll be a, you're probably every six weeks to a month um, that we'll be going through this and we'll just follow up with the students all the time, giving you, feeding you guys information to hopefully help with uh, all these mental health issues that seem to be popping up all over the place. And um, what we would like to suggest to all our students is, you know, please, if, if you do have a problem, the most important thing is to just come forward and, and, and tell someone about it, anyone, um, just so we can get the, the correct um, advice for you and the correct treatment as well for you. So thanks very much. Alan, thanks, thanks so much for, for taking us through it. If you've got, Anything else to say, let us know. But um, yeah, thank you for, for spending the time. Um, and I, I know on behalf of Campus Africa and, and our students, I, I greatly appreciate it just to understand the, the nuances that, that everybody's going through. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, and, and thanks to everyone for sharing. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope I get a chance to, to chat to you guys again. And uh, hopefully, when the app is developed, we'll be able to have more um, interaction with you because you'll be more anonymized. So yeah, that's, I look, I look forward to engaging with you again. I wish you all good luck. Thanks, thanks very much. Students, if, if you could just, um, any questions or anything that you want to ask Alan in the future, we can compile something. Just please just send them through anonymously to your student leaders and then we can take it from there. So th thanks so much, thanks Alan. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Take care, everybody. Have a good evening.